thanks. Uh, welcome everybody for this, which is the second last session for this um, year of this academic year for radical anthropology. Um, and we are venturing to the Neolithic with some more archaeoastronomy uh, tonight with John Cox, who's been regularly attending the radical anthropology lectures and is well versed in in our kind of archaeoastronomy background, especially Lionel Sims work. Um, and John is going to be talking about his work on the prehistoric temples of Malta and Gozo. So please, John, um, take it away. Okay. Right, well, the reason I, I, uh, I first came along to radical anthropology was because uh, um, I met Lionel Sims at um, a couple of conferences. Um, and um, he was quite interested in the moon. And of course, I was working on the moon, so we had that affinity. And um, something he said to me, which I'll try and get to, was look at the minor standstill. Well, I think we might get to the, line, the minor standstill by the end of the evening, but. Um, Let's begin with one or two basics. Okay, I think everyone will be familiar with the idea that the sun rises north of east in the summer and it rises south of east in the winter. And here in London, latitude 52, the overall spread is quite a lot. The overall spread is about 90 degrees. Um, June 21st, 45 degrees north, December 21st, 45 degrees south. So that whole difference between the most northerly rising point and the most southerly rising point is what you might call the amplitude, the amplitude of range in the azimuth of sunrise over the course of a year. Okay, uh, now the other effect that you be, might be familiar with is the idea of the solstice. Now at the moment we're approaching the summer solstice. So the sun has been rising further and further north until around June the 21st, it stops. It starts rising from very much the same position. In fact, for about three weeks, four weeks, you really can't tell the difference. Um, small differences in atmospheric refraction mean sometimes it rises a little bit farther north or a little bit farther south. And that's really down to whether it's been a hot day or a cold day or what have you. So this is called the solstice, that's the standstill. And the solstice isn't just one day. The solstice is a whole period. The solstice is two or three weeks. Um, how picky do you want to be? I say it's, it lasts about a month. I say we're virtually into it now. It's, uh, uh, it's June the 5th. I don't think you're going to be able to tell any difference in the length of a day from now for the next month. So we are already in the standstill. Now something similar applies to the moon. The moon rises north north of east at one point in the month and it moves south and then it rises well south of east at another point and the difference between the most northerly point and the most southerly point is half of a tropic month it's only uh, a tropic month is 27.3 days so uh, um yeah that's 13 days so it takes 13 days to get from its most northerly rising point to its most southerly rising point. But the overall amplitude of that range changes. 
it changes in an 18.61 year cycle. And it's normally called the 18.6 year cycle, rather clumsy, but there we are, the 18.6 year cycle. And at the moment, we're approaching the maximum of the cycle. So at its most southern, most rising point, the moon is rising well south of the sunrise and its most northerly rising point, which is just half of 27 days, just 13, 13 and a half days later, is rising well north. Um, okay, now the period from north to south and back again is 27 and a half days. And that is uh, two days shorter than a full month, a month full moon to full moon. So each time it gets to the most southern rising point, it's two days younger than it was the time before. We'll see, that, that matters, that comes to matter. Okay, now a bit like the sun, it reaches a most southerly rising point and it rises from very much the same position, certainly for two days, maybe even for three days. There's a slight difference, but it's not much. And the same is true at the northern end. Okay, so the moon shows a little, a little standstill once a month at its most southerly rising point. And it also shows a standstill at its most northerly rising point. We're going to concentrate on the southerly one. The next thing is this amplitude. The amplitude gets bigger for nine years, and then it comes to a maximum. And again, it, it returns to the most southerly rising point for a couple of years. It depends how finely you want to tune this, really, maybe three years. I think we're going to find out it's, it's usually about three years, give or take. Um, so that's also a standstill. And that's what's normally called the lunar standstill. Okay, uh, so. Now what we're looking at is some uh, prehistoric sites in Malta. And there are quite a number of them. Mostly they're terribly ruinous. This is a map of the, of the 30 or so identified so-called temple sites. And they're called temple sites because the first one to be uncovered, and this was uncovered, I think, in 1790, is this one, Gigantija. Uh, I think that just translates as the giant, or the giant woman, in fact, because it's a feminine form. So this is a giant woman, or maybe it was built by a giant woman. That's another story about it. This is huge. Running up the middle is a central aisle, so to speak, a central axis. And the cells either side, there are paired chambers either side, symmetric mirroring patterns, very similar to the sort of thing you get in a church, so you get a central aisle and you get sort of little side chapels and very often the chapels face each other. So this is perhaps one reason why it's called a temple. The other reason why it's called a temple is because it was uncovered in 1790 in the period of the picturesque tour. So anything like this was either it was going to be a palace or it was going to be a temple. So 1790, it was a temple. So this is one temple we're looking at in particular. And here's the rear wall. You can get the scale of this thing. This thing is gigantic. And what's quite interesting here is, is you see the way it's constructed. You see there's a, uh, what's called a header, and there's a stretcher, and there's a header, and there's a stretcher, and then there's a header. Now that's exactly the same as a brick wall is constructed. This is, so this is freestanding 
building. And the date of its construction is about 3,500, maybe 3,600 BCE. In fact, this might be the very first freestanding building, freestanding stone building in Europe for sure, maybe the world, who knows. This is a second one of these temples. This one is also pretty gigantic. Um, it's made of a very soft limestone. In this case, the other one wasn't. The other one had a, had a carapace of very hard limestone. This one's a soft limestone. It's got seriously eroded. The front was reconstructed. It was reconstructed in the 1950s. Um, so one has to be a little bit careful. You can never be quite sure what you have now was what was there originally. But the down the central aisle, you've got a line of flags. So that very probably is absolutely original. And so we're quite interested in the line, the line of the central aisle, the central axis, the central axis, as it's called. The third one I'm looking at is this one, which is Taj Arat, which is much, much smaller. But as you can see, it's still got a, a pretty megalithic front. It's got this rather nice dish front. It's got a line of steps. It's got this extraordinary lintel, which may or may not have been the original lintel. I think it may, may have been. Uh, there's a reconstruction story which I think is about 1930, 1920. But I'm assuming, I think we can assume they got it right. Okay, now of the sites that we saw earlier, the 30 so sites, most are pretty derelict ruins. Some have been deliberately ruined. A couple of, one, one at least has been lost because they built an airport over the top of it. So that one's gone entirely. Um, there are about 17 where you have a central apse with mirroring, mirroring units either side. Maybe the, and, and, and this is looking at the alignment down the central axis. And when you do this, what you discover is there's this quite interesting bunch around here. And there's three here. Gigantesia, which is the first one we looked at. Ajim, which is the second one we looked at. Tajarat, which is the third one we looked at. These have all got very similar bearings. They all face in a very similar way. Um, so an early paper here, I think 19, 1992, um, Pose the question, were these temples, were particularly this group here, and maybe this group in particular, but were this group here aligned on some astronomical marker? Because as we saw, one's in one island, one's at one end of the other island, and the other one is at the other end of the other island. So they're all widely separated in space. How come they're all facing the same way? So that was the question. And the 1992 paper came up with two ideas. One was that they might be aligned on the moon. And the other was that they might be aligned on the stars in the Southern Cross uh, and, and, and uh, Centaurus. Um, the 1992 paper, I'm sorry. The 1992 paper didn't like the moon hypothesis because, as it said, it could only really be applied to two temples. It didn't actually go on to say which two it was, but the two reading between the lines were Tajarat and Gigantesia. We'll see why in a bit. So here's one, Gigantesia, that's the huge one. 
Ajim, this is also pretty big down here. And the third one here, Tarajarat, very nice spread. Is there any sort of a material evidence of an interest in stars? Not much. There is this particular uh, little limestone shard. Uh, it's got a moon on it. It's got some stars on it. And it's got these strange radial lines. Okay. That's really the only, perhaps the only indication in, 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 in material remains. And there's not a lot of material remains, artifact remains from the temples. Okay, now we're looking at the star group, which Serio, Hoskin, and Ventura thought might have been used to orientate the southeast facing temples. Um, at the top here is a red giant star, star crux, and that's going to be actually red to the naked eye. If you look at that, you're going to see, see the color. Uh, people are always a bit surprised by the idea that stars are colored, but the red, bright red stars are very easy to see colored. There's about a dozen you can see colored, and Gar one of them. Here I've got them labeled. Here's Rigel Kent. Here's Haydard. Hey, these two turn up on the Australian flag. And here's the Southern Cross, which is normally there. There. Now, whether the historic man saw the cross as, a, as the Southern Cross, who knows? Maybe they saw it as a triangular sort of lozenge. Uh, a diamond shape, or maybe they didn't see them as a star group at all. Maybe they just saw the individual stars. Anyway, this is the grouping. Now, move that out of the way. Close that. Pick up this one. Okay, in the period 2005 to 2007, I and a group of people visited each of the three temples on a number of occasions in order to photograph or to observe and to photograph the moon rise. Because for whatever reason, I thought the moon hypothesis was rather a good one and I wanted to test it with practical observations. So my approach here is just, let's do it. Let's see how it works. Is it real? And I think the answer is yes. If I can move that across. Uh, ah, okay. So that was the first observation. That was made from Gigantesia, which is that big, the big, the big one in Gozo. And uh, that was done in May, uh, May 2005. Now this is a, a year short of the maximum of the temple, uh, the maximum of the lunar cycle. And we can see already the moon is rising pretty well down in line with the main axis of the temple. So came back in the spring of next year. This was taken in January. This is a shot by uh, uh, Mark Genby took this one. It's very difficult to see the moon low down. Any kind of cloud blots it out. Uh, I've never been able to observe a last crescent in this case, it's a last crescent rising at the level of the horizon. You always pick it up when it's a degree or two risen. So that's January. And that's an observation from Gigantia. Okay, now this is an observation made in February from another of the temples, it's from Ajayim. And uh, 
We're not very good at night photography at this stage, so it's not a very clear picture. And I've worked it up a little bit, but there's the moon there. So it's well to the left of the frame. This is Ajain. This is from Gigantia in March. So you can say the moon now has gained a bit. So it's a bit bigger. And again, it's rising, probably rising about there, pretty much in line with, with the, axis, the main axis of the temple. And this is the same shot, same, I'm not sure it's the same night or not. Let's go back. Yes, it's the same night. So, so another one of the ideas was to have somebody in one temple and somebody in another temple, and they were both photographed the same moonrise. And then we could compare the view from the two temples. So this is the first try from Tajarat. And again, it, there's an elevated horizon at Tajarat, but we can see it's rising pretty much in line with the main axis of the temple. Back in Tajarat next month, 4th, it's April. So the moon is a bit fuller now, it's last quarter. That's 2006, okay. Oh, right, okay, that's the next night. So we've got a shot here, this is one night, and then this is the night afterwards, and we can see it's moved along a little bit. Not a lot, but a bit. So, essentially speaking, you get two or maybe even three shots at a southern, southerly moonrise, one slightly more southerly than the others. In this case, that one's more southerly, that one's come north a little bit the next day because it's moving back. This is May. Actually here, it's setting just, it's rising just a little bit to the right. There's a line of houses here. Maybe the original horizon was this kind of escarpment here. And we've got a bunch, I visited these houses afterwards. They're three stories, some of them. And this is Arjeen. Let me see. So that's 15th of, uh, 15th of May. So that's 15th of May. So this is one of the cases when we've got an observation from one temple and an observation from the other temple. So now we can compare the two temples, assuming our observation point is right. And I've tried to standardize the observation point. I'll just cover that in a minute or two. But um, so here we can see in Gigantia, it's rising a little bit right to the right of the frame. Same, same moonrise observed from Ajim, and it's well to the left. And the rising point is down here. It's very difficult to see the rising point, in fact, because there's a wall here a line of trees, and then very strangely, there's something called the Southern Building here. Now restoring, you know, trying to work out what the original landscape was like, is quite tricky, but there might have been just a little glimpse of a sea horizon. On the other hand, the Southern Building is getting in the way, so we can assume the rising point is about here, and it's coming up on this line. So it's pretty much left of field in, 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 in Ajim. Let me see, let's compare. So, okay, second night. So that's a night later. Again, it's May. And here, this is one of the occasions when the moon rises at much the same point. One night, it's approaching the maximum point south, but we didn't quite get it. We saw it just before it got there. But the next night, it's coming away from the maximum point south. So it, it's exhibiting a little standstill. A little standstill is about you know, quarter of a degree, something like that. The moon itself, of course, is diameter half a degree. So the next thing to consider is that 
in the prehistoric period, the tilt of the Earth was slightly different, and the moon would have set about one, would have risen, sorry, the moon would have risen about one diameter further south than it is rising now. So what we're trying to do is, by making practical observations now, we're trying to work out what it would have looked like in period. Whether this, let me just check, is that the same night? Yep, same night. Gigantesia. Okay, rising point slightly to the right of the frame. Well, central to slightly right. Difficult to see. Here's the edge, here's the other edge. It's about in the middle, I think. So the rising point's about here. So maybe pretty much smack middle. Tajarat. Okay, now we. That was the first year. So I think what we saw here also was the fact that what you get is you get a series of moon rises. And the strange thing is it's running backwards through the phases. The first one was the last crescent. Two months later, it's the last quarter. May, June, it's a full moon. You can't get the one in July, August, and so on, not on the horizon, because this, the moon is, it looks bright at night, but it is not very bright, really, compared to something like the sun. And if the sun's up, there's too much light in the atmosphere for you to make out the shape of the moon when it's very low down. You can't actually see it. If the, if the sun, sun is still above the horizon, you can't see it. You can't see a moonrise at the level of the horizon. So this is just a spring. It just happens in the spring. You get the moonrise at the southerly rising point, January, February, March, April, May, June, and that's it. July, of course, it of course, it does rise, but now it's rising in daylight. You see it maybe when it's risen a few degrees, but you don't see it at the level of the horizon. So now we're in our third year of observations. This is now 2007. We're getting better at taking the photographs. The photographs are getting, you know, <laughs> are improving. Uh, so this is. March, a little bit left, but you can actually see the rest of the moon here at a diameter. And that's the position in the prehistoric period. This is one from Arjim. Now, as we can see, Arjim is, is the point of moonrise is well left of, is left of the frame. But actually, it's really rather nice once it's risen a bit. It's straight down the middle. We've got wooden boards here. Imagine if they were, uh, if the original flags were ex exposed. Put some water down them, and you would have you would have got glitter path. So there's a lot of room for theatrics, theatric displays from inside the temple. Okay, so the year 2007. We're just tidying up. Oh. <laughs> and occasionally having a bit of fun. This is an observation from the back of Arjim. Now, because Arjim has made of this very soft limestone, and because the rain now is very acidic, it's been eating away at the structure like nobody's business. And now it's been tented. They put a tent over the top to protect it. So this is not a particular brilliant photograph, but it's not bad. Uh, it's a, one of uh, uh, Michael Spiteri's photograph. That's, uh, that's Jupiter. This is uh, Scorpius. Not much color there, slight bit of color. That's Antares. 
And there's the main apse. We're a bit off center because there are other these supplementary temples to this one. It's a very complicated structure, but I think it's quite a fun shot. But um, just slip that in. One of the problems with observing from uh, uh, Algerine was the fact that there was a restaurant with some lights on, this wall, this bunch of trees, and here's the southern, the southern building. So again, we can see how a far southerly moon, moonrise only just escapes. In fact, now it probably doesn't escape if we could see right the way down to the true horizon it probably doesn't escape the southern building. But I think in period, because it, it rose one diameter further south, it would have just squeezed out. And this is quite an interesting feature. That's just a shot. Hey, <laughs> rather nice. Say hello to the moon. If you're sitting in the temple, you're waiting for the moon. Is the moon going to appear? And then it appears. To some extent, this moves you into the sort of frame of the inhabitants of these temples. The moon is a visitor. You're privileged to have her on board. Right, this is 2007. So now, this is now two years after the original shot. Perhaps the position of the moonrise is beginning to move a little bit left. But I think what this series of observations did demonstrate was that for two or possibly three years, you consistently got a moonrise, certainly down the center of Gigantija Temple, once and sometimes twice a night. So this wasn't just a single one-off observation. The number of possible observations is, well, I don't know, six times two, that's 12, times three, that's 36. You might get 36 shots at seeing it. One of the objections to the moon rise theory was that this was a rather a rare event. Well, here we've demonstrated that it's not a rare event. It has a pulse. It's coming in, in an 18.6, coming in a 19 year pulse. It hits the maximum. It's there for a couple of years, three years maybe. That's the standstill. And then it moves gradually out of frame. There we are. So that's the rise. And here's the sequence. Midwinter, don't see it. First month, last crescent. Next month, a bit more of it. Spring, last quarter. Waning gibbous, waning gibbous. Midsummer, full moon. So there's a magical trick here, which, uh, which Lionel was very keen on. The moon is running backwards. Normally when you see the moon rise, each night there's a little bit less of it. But when you start picking out this particular observation, suddenly you've reversed time. It's quite magical, really. And the moon is quite good like that. You can run lots of things in reverse with the moon. And this is one of the ways in which the moon runs widdershins. It runs things backwards. OK, uh, let's shut that one down. Context, bit of context. Just so you know where Gozo and Malta are. They're in the Mediterranean. They're about 50 miles south of Sicily. 
uh, you can't actually see them. You might be able to see them from Mount Etna, but otherwise speaking, they're out of sight of land. And Gozo and Malta were uninhabited until about 5000 BC. It's normally, first occupation is put at 5200. It's thought some people came across from Sicily and they might have brought a full Neolithic kit with them or at some stage early. That's to say they brought barley, they brought emma, they brought lentils, they might have brought goats. Um, it's really quite science fiction really, moving on to another planet, these uninhabited islands first occupied and for about a thousand years that first settlement seemed to have just got on with it nobody much visited they might have had a little bit of contact with sicily uh, they had obsidian which they didn't have on the island they had a bit of flint which they didn't have on the island they have chert which is kind of flintish but it's not so hard as flint um, no metal, of course, because we're in the Neolithic. At this point here, so-called Zibug period, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm pronouncing it that correctly, there's some sort of change. in These periods are named after pottery styles. We've got, we've got a gray, we've got, <laughs> we've got a gray clay here. And then at this period here, it was suddenly changed to a red, a red style, but it's much the same pottery style. And at this point here, 4000 BC, there's some sort of change in style. Suddenly we got ochre painted pottery. So maybe there was a second group arrived, or maybe there's some renewed contact with the outside world, because essentially speaking, there won't have been much contact. There's very little exotic material discovered from this period. And certainly true now, the prevailing winds, the prevailing currents carry you from Sicily down to Malta and Gozo quite easily. But those same prevailing conditions make it really rather difficult to get away. Well, we don't know about navigation in the period, but maybe the boats weren't that advanced. So getting there would be fairly easy. Getting away was tricky. So there's an there was a clearly a bit of trade with Sicily, but not a lot, as I understand it from reading the standard accounts. Temple building begins here, and it's named after Gigantesia, which is that huge one that we saw, and that's normally dated at about 3,600. So now temple building comes in two phases. There's a Gigantesia phase, and then there's a late stage called the Tarkshin phase. And then at the end of the Tarkshin, about 2,500, that was it. The temples were abandoned. Not quite abandoned, perhaps, because another group seemingly with very different habits took over in Tarkshin temple itself. But essentially speaking, there was a period of temple building. It went on from here, from 3,600, and the temples then were continually used for a thousand years. More temples were added in this period here, and then the whole thing stopped. It's a bit of a mystery. This is dated to about 3,800. Okay, collected burial. The dead were buried in, in underground in caves to begin with. Uh, well, always in fact. Um, and at about 3,800, the people got quite good at cutting them out. So here, here's a standard, here, here's an underground, mortuary and bone store, if you like, chamber two. The rock's quite soft, so what do you do? You, you begin by cutting a central chamber, 
and then you cut a supplementary cell and, and you leave a bit of the wall standing to hold the roof up. If you don't do that, the roof might collapse. So we've got a central chamber here, and then we've got a little cell cut out, and then another one cut out, and then another one, and we've got an intervening wall. So when we look at a three apse type temple like Tajarat, we've got the same format. We've got a central chamber here, which is flagged. And then we've got a supplementary chamber here, a supplementary one, a supplementary one here. And this is very like an underground burial chamber, except now it's been constructed above ground. Now, the, the, the was, there was stone walled building to some height or other, right the way through and preceding the temple building period. But the feature about the temples is you suddenly get a, a complex of cells in a single unified structure. And again, you can see little traces of stretcher, header, perhaps not so much in this one. And in the middle, you've got a kind of courtyard. Now, was this courtyard roofed or was it open to the sky? Well, opinion is divided. My part, I'm inclined to think that most of this was open because you've got these little structures here. It's much easier to roof each one individually. And then if this central section here is free, you can get at the roof and you're going to maintain these things for a thousand years. You want to be able to get on the roof to keep the thing going. And also in some of the bigger ones, you have fires. Maybe this is a fire pit, maybe this is a fire pit. So unless you've got a central area to let the smoke out, it's going to be rather ghastly inside. Here you can see the head of stretcher, structure around the edge of Gigantesia. And the thing you notice here is there's a pair of temples. There's two of them. Here's the big one, and here, so to speak, is the daughter. Now it's thought this one here, Gigantesia, was the main temple, was the earlier one, and this one is a little bit later. It's a slightly different format, and it's facing in a slightly different direction. Now for the observations, we were just interested in the main temple, so to speak, the big one. And we tried to choose a simple position to take photographs from, which was easy to, to find, easy to return to, and had some sort of a ceremonial feeling. You invite somebody into your house, you might receive them in the hall. In here is the, the inner zone. So here's the point at which you receive them. So when you're inviting the moon into the temple, this, so to speak, is where you stand to greet her. The vertical orthostats here, vertical orthostats here, there's a terrific threshold, beautiful stone here, and we take a central position at the waist of the building. And the same is said for the observations from Archim, same thing. Again, we've got this pair of orthostats at the waist of the building, so we can have we can reproduce the same observation position in this temple as well. And indeed, the same observation position in Ta Tajarat. So this has two effects. It standardizes, so to speak, the point of observation. So you can compare one temple with the other. And the other thing is it's quite an easy position to find in the dark. You've got the two, two orthostats. You can just measure off the center and you know where to put your camera. So upshot is you can then start 
You've got a standard position in each of the three temples, and you can start comparing how things look. So this is from Gigantia, three different observations made from Gigantia, and you can see Gigantia is slightly right of center, center, slightly left of center. So Gigantia, for whatever reason, is on target for a far southerly moonrise. Tajarat isn't. Sorry, I'm getting no. Sorry, no, no, no. no. We're uh, we're in we're in our, we're in Arjim here. Arjim is well well off center. It's at least two or three degrees away from the central position. Tajarat not bad. Had a diameter to give us the prehistoric period. Pretty central, maybe maybe very slightly left of center, maybe pretty much smack on. Okay, halfway through the temple building period, there was some sort of change. This is the most extraordinary structure. Um, there's a series of natural caves, and these have been opened up, and they get better and better opening up. And suddenly, at about 3,800, no, 3,200, so it's estimated, uh, you get this extraordinary mimicking of the surface style in the underground burial chamber and ossuary. This is one of a, uh, this is the middle level of a whole collection of rooms constructed underground. This one's about five meters underground. It's estimated that this complex, which was in use for the whole temple period, maybe starting even before temple building, reaching this extraordinary peak at about 3,200, it's thought that this complex contained the bones of about, so it was estimated, 7,000 individuals, which were shuffled around. We're not quite sure how it worked in this one, unfortunately, because it was, it was cleared, I think, in 1902. And for whatever reason, the clearance record was lost. So the locations can be guessed at and have been fairly well worked out, but we're not quite certain what was where, which spaces were kept empty, and which ones had bones stored. Now, there was some sort of process of resorting. Uh, uh, there's another one of these underground uh, hypogea discovered in Gozo, and that was excavated well, fairly roughly at one point, bits fell in, and then it was the bits which hadn't yet fallen in, or the bits that had been fallen in and were safe, were safely covered, were then uncovered, I think, in an excavation. I'm not quite sure the date of it, but maybe it was about 1980, 1990. Um, and so a lot of what one knows about what went on in these underground uh, bone stores is based on what was discovered opening up this other one in uh, Gozo. But this one here in Malta at Hull Safliani has got this extraordinary rock cut architectural feature. So what this suggests really is, is at this point the world of the underworld has in some sense collided with the overworld. The world of the temples is becoming metaphoric for this underworld, or maybe this underworld is metaphoric, who knows? But there's some sort of collision between the two worlds, the world of the dead and the world of the living, and the architecture of the dead and the architecture of the living have, at this point, 
confused in some way. Everyone now possibly is lost in metaphor. Now here's a quite an interesting feature. We're looking into this chamber. In here is another chamber. And then in here is yet another chamber. So this is three chambers in. We're not looking smack into the center of this innermost chamber. We're slightly offset. There's, there's some sort of uh, um, maybe shelf arrangement here to the left. You can't see it. This is, I think, maybe this is a feature of quite a lot of the temples. The, the direct line of sight is averted. There's an aversion, there's a, there's a hiding, there's a slight displacement of the view. And that is rather like what we saw in Ajaim, where the moon could only just come clear of the southern building. Only at the very extreme point of the range was it allowed in. Otherwise, the southern building would have excluded it. So there are our three temples that we're looking at, Trigantia, Tajarat, small one, Ajin, the huge one. This is the Hypogeum, which is the one, the underground one we were just looking at. And here's Zara, which is uh, another one of these Hypogea, not so fully worked as Hal Safiini, but in the case of, ja in the case of Jara's circle, megaliths were brought down and put in. And so some temple structures, structures of uh, shells and apses and trilithons and all the furniture of the surface, surface temperature, all the, the furniture of the surface temple was imported in to the burial chambers underground. So again, we had this kind of collision of the world above and the world below. One of the major finds from the Jara mortuary complex was this figure here, thought to be two women. Not necessarily the case. This one on the left probably is a woman. She's got a little child here. There's a figure on the right, got a bowl, which is probably an ochre bowl. And then here we can see the red ochre staining of the feet because the bones in Jara were sort of buried in earth, but there was a lot of ochre in there as well. And they were buried in the red earth. Okay. Okay, uh, that's that lot. Okay, now the theory I'm working on is that these uh, these three temples, at least, were aligned on the moon. But there is, as it were, another strand in this particular study, which was the strand that. Serio, Hoskin, and Ventura kind of went for in 1992, although they did hedge their bits a bit. A bit. One of the great things about uh, uh, the Centaurus crux theory is that it's always a bit vague. Which one were you looking at? Which of these stars, we, we, you know, w w was it Rigel Kent? Was it Hadar? Was it Garcrux? And these have got slightly different points that they rise. So uh, <laughs> provided you don't plump for one, you're okay. You're not gonna get caught. So I've done context. So now I'm just gonna take a brief look at the star theory. Now this is not my theory. Um, as I say, it was the one put up by um, Serio, Hoskin, and Ventura. And then um, Tori Lums Darlin has plumped for this one a couple of years ago very strongly. Okay, 
So this is a star theory. Now the orientation of the Earth respect, with respect to the fixed stars is not stable. It's doing this little cycle over 26,000 years. So now we're looking about how were things 7,000 years ago? Okay, well, the axis of the Earth didn't point this way. The axis of the Earth sort of pointed that way kind of thing. This is called precession. And, and the effect is that some stars were much higher in the sky and other stars were much lower. I mean, the constellations would have been much the same. Not we necessarily know that the, you know, this group of people in Malta saw the same constellations that we do, but the groupings would have been, the, the, the mutual arrangements between the fixed stars is stable over this kind of period. But how they appear from Malta, our case here, is, was very different in, say, 3600 BC, which is the period we're looking at. So this is the March sky, midnight. That's the June sky, midnight. That's the September sky. This is a fairly kind of familiar kind of sky, except now we get it in the winter. But we've got, uh, we've got Orion here, and we've got a bright star down here, Rigel. Pleiades, that's the September sky. And then December sky, there's a whole bunch of stars now which have moved well south. So this is Hadar. Rigel Kent hasn't risen yet. This is December midnight, and there's Garcrux. And there's this whole arrangement here. Now, now these particular maps, these are maps are produced on uh, Richard Monkhouse's program, Starry 8. Um, many people nowadays use a different program called Solarium, but I don't like Solarium so much. I, I like this program, so this is the one I'm using. I'm using Richard's program. Now I put in all the stars. This is the autumn sky. And this is all the stars down to 6.5, which is magnitude 6.5, which is thought to be about the limit of human sight. And we can see there's quite a long, there's, there's a line of stars running out here. The, um, Kings Major, Orion, Hyades, Pleiades, running up to Perseus. There's a bright band. And then this one is quite extraordinary. This is the midnight sky, midwinter. And you've got this great line of stars running along parallel to the ocean, looking south. Uh, here's the Southern Cross here. There's Garcrux there. Here's Hadar. Nigel Kent hasn't risen yet. So this, essentially speaking, is the line of the Milky Way. Now, the Milky Way is a dark sky phenomenon. Um, a dark adapted eye, cones, rods. Rods are what you see with under very low light conditions. And if you give them half an hour to maximize, then they're 10,000 plus times more sensitive than day vision. You've got to keep the light down, they get swamped. You lose that ability if you expose yourself to bright lights. But in the prehistoric period, there probably weren't any bright lights. So the Milky Way would have been much more visible. It won't have been this visible because this is what the camera sees. This is a view of the Milky Way taken by Mike Treadgold. It's taken actually in Auckland, New Zealand. But here we have Rigel Kent, Hadar, 
two bright stars of Centaurus. And let's just zoom in a little bit. There's Gar Crux there. Here's a wonderful gas cloud, the coal sack. Uh, that's the head of the head of, head of the Black Llama. If you uh, are doing Andean astronomy, and it might be the head of the is it the emu in the Australian Milky Way version? Because most cultures from a time when there weren't artificial lights, tractors, so, saw the Milky Way, perhaps not quite so amped up as we get it in the um, long exposure photograph. Nevertheless, it was seen as maybe a god, maybe a goddess, maybe an animal, maybe as a river of light. And I think a river of light is quite interesting because where does it get refreshed? It gets refreshed when it drops into the ocean. So now we're just going to take a little tour down the Milky Way. Work this one off. Where are we? Uh, Toxine, compare, processional. No, we're not going to take a little desktop. Excuse me for a moment. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> Found it. This is a nice paper by Ilario Cristofaro, 21. Now she's quite keen on the Centaurus crux hypothesis and her point is that if you watch the Milky Way and I've amped up the Milky Way a little bit on this map I've cheated a bit what I've done is I've taken faint B types which tend to line up down the plane of the Milky Way because that's where they're made they're made within the um, galactic arms so I've amped up the bees and they're going to stand in for the Milky Way Okay, so that's the view from Malta in period. Let's just wind back a little bit. Here's the Southern Cross, there's Garcrux. And uh, Lario Cristofaro's theory is that Garcrux was of interest in the period because it's quite close to the pivot point. There's the Milky Way, it's coming up out of the ocean, it's going back in again. And the Southern Cross is close to the central action. There it is setting, here's the Southern Cross. Here's uh, Hadar, here's Rigel Kent. Okay, so that's one reason perhaps why The Milky Way was of great interest. So now we're looking at the star theory. Now, the star theory rather relies on the three temples having exactly the having very, very similar fields of view. And if they were aligned pretty much on azimuth 130, as this example is, then the theory is that Garcrux, Gamma Crucis, Garcrux, first becomes visible at the critical altitude, which is about three degrees. Below three degrees, you can't see it because the atmosphere just wipes it out. 
But at about three or four degrees, it's a bit tricky. Three degrees, to my mind, is a bit low, but um, there are arguments in favor, there are arguments against. But suppose Garcrutz became visible at three degrees above, and suppose these three temples all pointed towards the same azimuth at 130, then Garcrux, which might have been of interest, perhaps for the reason that Ilario Cristofaro put forward because of its relation to the rest of the Milky Way, would have appeared, as it were, at about here, and this would have been sufficiently interesting to have aligned the temples on it. Now, a difficulty with this theory is that the three temples we're looking at don't have precisely the same frame. We've seen that this frame here is probably pretty good. Rising track declination 30. Well, the moon is actually rising. The far southerly moonrise is rising very close to declination 30. It's rising at declination 29. So it's about this kind of path here. So we can see that that, that pretty much matches what we saw in Arge yes, pretty much matches our gene. The rising point was well to the left. And so by the time it got up to sort of middle of the view, it was appearing pretty much in the middle of the temple. And that conforms to where Garcrux would have been seen in period. But the fact is that Gigantia, for example, is well to the left. Quite how much, difficult to say, but uh, I'm supposing it's at least two degrees further left, maybe two and a half. So for Gigantia, this same theory that has Garcrux, aligned on Garcrux, to my mind, doesn't really work. And I think that Targeret also has a similar sort of frame. So I don't think it really works for Targeret either. In period, 3,600, another star was rising smack in the middle, and that was Rigel, foot of Orion. Well, again, we're still just looking at uh, Ajim here, and here's Rigel rising in the middle of the field. So here's, here's Rigel here, rising in the doorway. And if we've got an open courtyard, then we've got all these stars appearing overhead. In fact, we've got the Milky Way is lining up with the main axis of the temple. Put Garcrux in the doorway, this doesn't happen. Put Garcrux in the doorway, and the sky overhead is pretty empty. Mm -hmm. so this is an autumn. The first time you actually see Garcrux rising above the horizon is sometime around the autumn equinox, which by coincidence is the same time as the helical rising of Garcrux. But uh, there we are, there's a lot of coincidences going on here. <laughs> now, I quite like this one. I'm kind of working up the star theory to see how it looks. So I couldn't resist <laughs> trying to apply it to Tarkshin. This is a Tarkshin temple. Uh, and Tarkshin temple is facing southwest rather than southeast. I tried to get uh, Rigel Kent in the doorway. Well, I can get it in the doorway at about 10 degrees up, but I can't get it any more central than that. And down here is Garcrux. Tarkshin consists of two temples. This is the South Temple looking, for, looking out, and it's got a main doorway. 
But there's also a second temple, the, se the central temple, so called. And we'll click to that now. John, have we got my, another five minutes or so? Or? Yeah, the about yeah. That, I think that's right. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna finish that. in fifteen minutes. Oh, fifteen is quite quite Ten long. Minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, so this is Tokshin. Tokshin was pretty much reconstructed at the front, but you can tell which bits were reconstructed. Um, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of courtyard here. And we're quite interested in this temple here. That's the one that struck me. Okay. Um, the trouble with this temple is it doesn't actually have a doorway. It looks into this temple. This is this is uh, the South Temple. Just to show you some of the uh, decorative stonework, it's really quite lovely. And here's uh, there was this extraordinary figure, which is about maybe two meters high. Mm. It have lost the top. Um, so this is a single figure. This is the temple we're interested in. This one here. It's got a big. Let's go back a bit. This stone here, which is a replacement, got melted away by acid rain. This is the original, which was taken up into. Uh, uh, into the museum in Valletta. So there's an oculus that's to stop you going in. Well, we've gone in and we're looking out. And now we've got an artificial horizon here. And this is our viewpoint. Again, we're at the waist of the temple, center of the waist, looking out in this direction here. Now, I wasn't able to do a moon set because now we're looking southwest and we're looking at the moon set but i was able to get a star photograph so we've got uh, a couple of stars in capricornus here we've got jupiter here we've got venus we've got a few other stars and we can use this to line up a star map we line up a star map we get setting path for an object at declination minus 29 which is the setting declination for the moon set in period, the far southerly moon set. So, hey, we had Tokshin, we got a double group. We got the southeast group giving us this backward sequence in the spring, and we've got this autumn group giving us this sequence all the time getting younger, time reversed, down the dark moon at midwinter. Hmm. As we can see, Garcrux doesn't line up for Tarkshin Central, but the moon does. Okay, so that's pretty much completes but we just got a final point here so this is returning to lionel's original point mm -hmm. just look for the minor standstill now here at the major standstill the moon is rising very far south and here at the minor it's inside the sun the sunrise point is halfway between the two cycles. There's a maximum cycle and there's a minimum cycle. For, so for nine years in the cycle, the moon is rising somewhere south of the, of the, moon, of the sun point. Mm -hmm. And for the other nine years in the minor end of the cycle, it's rising inside of the sun point. Mm. Well, all of these temples well, not all of them, but most of the south ones have also got a, an offset line to the midwinter sunrise. This is Gigantesia, 
Now the capstone's gone, so the light is penetrating right to the back, but we can just see the shadow of the orthostat here. So if there had been a lintel over the top, the sunlight wouldn't have got any further in than this. Hmm. The sunlight is stopped here. This is a midwinter sunrise. But you've got a position here, and you can tell of measuring the midwinter sunrise. Mm. And at the temple next door, Chiganti in North, you've also got a way of measuring the midwinter sun, sunrise. It, it, it lights up this orthostat here, it really does rather nicely. Mm. This is a very good, so this is a midwinter sunrise, it's lighting up this offset, it's an offset orthostat. Here at Tajarat, this is a midwinter sunrise, and it's lighting up this apse here. It's offset. It doesn't get to the back of the temple, but it gets to this bit here, offset. So you've got a way of spotting the midwinter sunrise. Mm. And again, lastly, at Arjim, this is a midwinter sunrise. This is the lintel shadowing it. It doesn't get to the back. It's offset. Uh, as the sun gets higher, so it comes down here, so it never actually penetrates. But you do have a way of spotting where the mid-winter sunrise is. And because you've got a way of spotting where the mid-winter sunrise is, you've got a way of spotting where the moon goes inside of the sun for the minor half of the cycle. So from each of these temples, you've got to line out to the maximum of the cycle, and you've got to line to the minimum end of the cycle. Now I spent a lot of time trying to work out, well, what utility was this mm. moon observation in period? And the only one I can think of is that this was an incest taboo thing. If you were born, at the major end of the cycle, mm. you could go with somebody who was born at the minor end because they'd be nine years older than you, or they'd be nine years younger than you. Mm. So you'd be always be safe if you were a, a major standstill native, and you could always go with somebody who was a minor standstill native, and it wouldn't be your mum, it wouldn't be your dad, There is a chance, of course, it might be your brother, it might be your sister, so you, maybe you could have a rule which says that you mustn't go with somebody who's also a minor standstill or a major standstill. So this is a way, really, of dividing the population to two halves and putting a, a remove of nine years between them. And this is, I think, outside of the magical properties of an alignment on the moonrise and, and the fact that you're running time backwards, all that sort of thing, there's possibly an incest taboo utility hmm. within an early population. I don't know, that's just a speculation, but that's for Lionel. Thanks, Lionel, that's the best I can do. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, hmm. In conclusion, I'm suggesting that three, three temples, mm. well, certainly these, these two, Gigantija and Tajarat, are aligned on the moon. And I think Arjim might be as well. It's a little bit off in the case of Arjim, but I think it might be. Now, there's another whole group here, as far as I'm concerned. Well, maybe these, these were aligned on the southern group of stars, and certainly the southern group of stars, that those stars would have been a much better fit for this group here. This group here are all early. These are all Gigantesia phase, first phase temples. These ones down here are all later. These are all Tarkshin phase. Mm. See, what happens in the middle is this, well, you've got two groupings, really. Uh, so maybe the early phase temples were aligned here, 
on the moon, and that was okay. Everyone then was happy enough to go off with different orientations. We've seen that within the group that we drew up from, from Zara, the twin goddess, assuming they were both goddesses, we got a twin goddess thing. So there's no reason why you shouldn't have two stellar alignments, at least one stellar and one lunar. This is perfectly okay, I would have thought. Uh, I would have thought going for a single rules all type theory was a way of casting our own present day monolithic present day way only one god kind of thing hmm. onto the prehistoric mind and i don't see why we should do that okay that's me finish i hope that wasn't too confusing there thanks john can we end the screen share fantastic there we go I'm going to stop sharing. Fantastic. Thanks, John. That, that, that took us through some amazingly um, complex astronomy and some extraordinary sites. Um, absolutely fascinating because I, I've hardly known anything about, uh, uh, about this culture um, and brilliant suggestions. Um, does anybody want to come up with some comments and response? We've got some experts here. Anybody like to come back on some of these ideas? I'd like to hear from Frank uh, Ventura. <laughs> Me too. Frank was going to say something. Craig, you there? Oh. No, no response at the maybe, moment. Maybe Frank's so, so annoyed with you that he's, um, he's vanished. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, Anybody else? It, it, I mean, just be just to push on more questions. It, it, it has the sense that all these different temples offer so many kind of different aspects on the skies, the the directions they're looking in, that you've got some sort of collective obser community observatory community um, going on. I, I mean, that that's what it immediately the sense of it is um, with with these particular groups that you've picked on um, focused exactly on these these lunar standstill or or potentially the the um, Milky Way pivots um, well, well, well the three I focused on are in a sense the big early ones two of them are the two big early ones mm -hmm. I see these as being the mother temples yeah. at the beginning of the period. Yeah. So I see that there was a lunar, there was a lunar attachment at the beginning of the period, yep. and that and subsequently it got shifted. Yeah. And a second line came in. Yeah. This might have attended some sort of shift in the power arrangement. Anyway, you might have um, Malone. Uh, who is it? It's a. Uh, um, Stoddart and Malone, who were two archaeologists, uh, um, quite well known, I think. Um, they got very keen on the idea that, that a priesthood emerged within the Tarkjean. Uh -huh. So some kind of appropriate appropriation. Yeah, there's an appropriation process. Yeah. There's a lot of collectivization early on. We have we have collective burial. In fact, collective burial continues right through. So that suggests a very the origin is terrifically egalitarian. Everyone gets buried together. Mm. But yeah. then as you move into the Tark gene, the spaces become increasingly secretive. Yes. So there's some sort of process of appropriation, and there might have even been a some sort of gender shift or some uh, 
there's so, maybe there's I mean I mean you've got a thousand years to do it. Yeah. A thousand years is enough time yeah. mm -hmm. for this gender shift to come on. It's it's fun that there wouldn't have been hunting. This would have been um, agriculture with pastoralist a bit uh, pretty pretty well, well, right, right the way through, yeah. yeah. Um I, there've been various studies done on, on this. Um uh, but I, I think the argument is that they moved into full-time agriculture very early on. The population gradually grew, so more temples got built in the Tarkshin as all the available agricultural land was taken. Right. By the end of the Tarkshin, that was it. It had reached, as it were, maximum population, which was something maybe okay. it's between 10,000 and 20,000. Right. And, most odds are it was about twelve thousand. That kind of that kind of point. You've got thirty temple complex, thirty temple sites mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. share between twelve thousand people. I'm not quite sure how that works out, but uh, okay. that gives you some notion of local five communities. Six, five or six hundred people, or something. Yeah. But the big complexes have got several temples in them. Um, Right. So, um, Wait, so in that case of kind of land shortage, you you might expect an emergence of something quite patrilineal in those circumstances. You'd think that that could be associated with gender shift. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, it, it, because it, you it, need it, to you need to establish your land claims and hang on to it and and yeah all that sort of thing yes and, and, and this is another reason why the temples have perhaps why they have slightly different orientations because you don't want to have the same orientation as the temple next door to you no you want to be different yeah so there, this gives, this gives be, you a scatter there could be all kinds of stories associated to ancestry represented in the sky of some sort of something all that sort of thing so, so we're going to go for Rigel Kent. Hey, we're going to go for Regina. Hey, we're going to go for Garcrux, and so on. Yep. I think Tori has a question. Right. Was it, am I right? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. That was uh, very interesting and uh, very detailed uh, what you presented there. Excuse me. And um, what, what, what? It, you mentioned what, why, what could have been the reasoning for its temple orientations. You, you keep to three temples, but there are other temples as well that has these alignments in them, which I discovered during my, my research, which I, my PhD research, which I submitted last year. But the, the, the big question in all this is uh, why were they oriented the way they were? You mentioned uh, obviously the car crooks, uh, the star, uh, which uh, which could be, have been. It, uh, you may the, the, the could have been the major lunar standstill, or it, as well that the 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 winter solstice sunrise, which has more temples than the three you mentioned, which has this offset illumination. And and now I just want to to to. Uh, Obviously, we will never know the, the exact answer in this, but um, and we have to be careful not to let our modern mind influence the way the prehistoric uh, people thought or, 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 or constructed things. But the thing is that if you think about the, the major lunar standstill, that happens every 18, 18 19 years. And you have the, the winter solstice, sunrise happens every year. And um, you have also that, that the stars, the god crooks, that happens also every year. It, it has its heliacal rising around the, 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 um, the, the, the autumn equinox and it disappears again around the spring equinox. So you would, which you would see every day. So um, wouldn't it be more, a more potential is that they would align temples to what they would see 
more often that bought something that will happen only every 19 years. Okay. Um, the argument is that prehistoric societies were ruled by the moon. The moon determined when you could go out at night and when you couldn't. Simply that. Um, so you follow the moon. The moon is the primary. The moon is the primary timekeeper. The moon gives you the middle of the winter. The moon gives you the spring. The moon gives you the summer. The, the southerly moonrise, the southerly full moon is midsummer. The northerly full moon is midwinter. So yeah. all those measures, the measures for the solar year can be perfectly easily measured by taking notice of the moon. And you, in the prehistoric period, you took more notice of the moon because you didn't have artificial lighting. The moon was your main light source. And then there are other arguments for following the moon. And, and, and these are, 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 are to do with the cycles of women, the menstrual cycle and so forth, which are also lunar, lunar aligned. So if you have a society in which women are strong and you have a society in which timekeeping is regulated by the moon, then the moon gets to be primary, perhaps in a way that stars aren't. Stars are interesting if you're navigating a boat, but we can see that these temples were built in a period when there wasn't much navigation. There was a bit of navigation, as we know, but not much. There's hardly any exotic materials discovered on these islands in the temple period. These islands were pretty well cut off, just a little bit of trade, maybe a little bit of obsidian, maybe a bit of ochre, although it's beginning to look as if ochre was produced locally as well to some large extent. Anyway, so that's my answer to that, uh, to that objection, is that the moon is primary, and the business of time-telling and looking at stars is really rather secondary. The other point, I think, was to do with the main alignment. We're trying to keep it simple. We're just looking at the main axial alignment of the temple. The moment you start looking at offset alignments, what happens if the light comes into the slant this way or to slant that way, then you've doubled and trebled the number of alignments you can look at. Mm. So yeah. in favor yeah. of keeping the argument simple, sticking just to the main axis. No, of course, John, the, the moon, moon was important. I, I don't. Uh, Absolutely, but the first the first calendars. I mean, we know about Mesopotamia; they were moon based. But but later they they changed it over to sun sun movements calendar because the moon calendar is out of sync because it's only uh, you know so so it it turns the season out of sync and that's why they turn into sun based calendars. Okay, come back on that one. You're quoting Mesopotamia, you can also probably quote Egypt. These are states. These are vast, huge societies, hierarchical societies with cities and rulers engaging in warfare with neighboring states. We're into modern, yeah, sure, once you move into big states, then everyone switches into the sun because that's the arrangement. But when you're in small scale egalitarian societies, you don't move into the sun. You move into the sun once you want to get taxation. So Mesopotamia, yeah, tax the people, got to be solar. Yes, but, but we're in we... a pre-tax society here. <laughs> we're in an egalitarian society, so we're still okay with the moon. Yeah, but, but the, the, the problem with the moon and the calendar is that you have 13, Thirteen uh, lunar cycles okay. in a solar year, and so that's why that yeah, that comes out of sync eventually, okay. and that's that's why I I, say, I don't say. Chris, that did you the, did you want to say something, Chris? I mean, that? just, just just obviously the, the the question there is out of sync with what? I mean, clearly the moon is out of sync with the sun in the sense that you know you can't you you can't have you can only get it you can you can only get the months synchronizing with us with the with the, with, the, with the year by having artificial months you know and, and just you know some some 
bishop, as obviously in Europe, ends up deciding that there's 31 days or 30 days or 28 days in, and all that stuff. But um, critical, surely, about the switch over from the, the moon to the sun is you, you can organize a hunting expedition once a month and, and hopefully be able to you know, fit, catch the animals by full moon when it's safest to be out, uh, out at night. But what you can't do is, um, when, as soon as you get um, ag agriculture, you can't you can't sow the seeds and then reap the harvest. You need a whole year, and so obviously the seasonal calendar, the, the solar calendar, begins to take priority. And of course, connected with that, as as I think John's po pointing out, you then begin to get not immediately states, of course, but you certainly begin to get you know increasing intensification of patriarchal power at the expense of a of a system which is much more egalitarian and much more tuned with women's monthly cycles. So, I mean, sure, sure, the moon's out of sync, but why would that be a problem? I mean, it was originally not a problem, but it becomes a problem when, you know, when the seasonal calendar begins to take priority because you're into, you're into agriculture. But uh, I, I'd like to come back on the agriculture and the moon because I know people here in Norfolk who do all their planting by the moon. Mm. And um, in a beef, for instance, there's a lunar calendar published every year, and that's what the farmers go on. Mm. So they're we, farmers, but they're still running it on a lunar calendar. Right. You, you so can do that. You can do that, John, but there's, there's no absolute, there's nothing obligatory about following the moon. I mean, I can understand why people like to follow in the moon, but I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure it's got quite the same coercive necessity. As so it, listen, you know. that we're, we're talking about something that's a transitional state, isn't it, between where John's identifying that there's still a very strong focus on the moon yeah. by, on, a, on a large scale time cycle with these temples, clearly of great importance, before it shifts. And, and it's a, a background of subsistence agriculture, which isn't really to do with hunting. Next week, we're going to hear from Bernie Taylor on the lunar timekeeping of the Upper Paleolithic, but it is an intersection of lunar calendar with a solar seasonal calendar because it's a northerly latitude of Upper Paleolithic. Um, so these, all of these cultures are working at how to reconcile the moon with the seasons, but there are many mechanisms for just letting slip that you know just you can just slip through the winter months to to bring up the spring moons and the observations that um that that, that uh, john was focused on for instance and we'll hear about it um in respect of ethnographic calendars next week as well um so so i i think it's uh you know we we, we can't just say it's just hunting just farming it's there's there's a kind of transitional state between the two for quite can a can i just say that the the, the, the little um possibly bit of imaginative reconstruction that I, I most enjoyed from your talk um john was the idea of receiving the moon as a as a guest as a visitor mm. uh, and of course that immediately takes me back to this idea that so many hunter gatherers have which is that the, the moon is woman's other husband and that while the moon's not visible in the sky, while, while it's dark, um, the moon has been welcomed <laughs> by, by women as their other husband. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the sign of that visit from the moon is, 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 is menstruation. And it's just lovely how you, um, how you sort of picture the architecture of those, um, those, those temples as, as in support of that, that here is where the visitor arrives and <laughs> it's welcomed. It was really lovely, really lovely, lovely touch. There, there's some very nice stuff in the chat. Um, Audrey, did you want to say anything about some of the background stories that associate? Um, and also, Ivan, you, you had something there on the snakes. Might be worth saying something. I don't know if Audrey can speak. Um, Ivan, do you want to talk about the snakes just a bit? Just mention it. Yes, I can't remember in in complete detail, um, but we were, me and Brian Campbell were out there. We took some students on a field trip um, this year to Malta, and we actually managed to visit the hypogeum as well. 
And when we're on tours of other archaeological sites, a Maltese man was telling us, Brian's Maltese as well, so he'd know the story, but I don't think he's here anymore, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, it was a kind of very much like a St. Patrick's story of someone clearing or getting rid of all the snakes from the island. And I mean, I've got a feeling there's quite a few stories like that across the world, but I interpret it as probably kind of an ending of um, female associations with serpents or something like that. I don't know. That's just my interpretation. Potential solidarity, pretty much. Yeah, well. exactly. Yeah. So, um, and I thought it. I thought it was really interesting because, like you say, I think what's interesting here is with these kind of temple complexes, we shouldn't really think that they're probably some kind of um, egalitarian society. It's more likely that they're appropriating symbols from earlier um, egalitarian, um, gender egalitarian gr uh, groups, you know, so it, take the moon obviously would be clearly a, a super important symbol and it, and it has to perhaps be invited into houses as a way of kind of preserving, maintaining that power or what's the word I'm looking for, um, appropriating that power for a different kind of social organization. That's what I would assume in those places. And, you know, when the, the likewise with, um, with the underworld stuff, when I was in the hypergeum, that's kind of what I was thinking of. This is a way of perhaps appropriating um, a different kind of symbolic order that, that, that was mapped onto a different social order into this new, more patriarchal order. That, but, you know, I could be talking nonsense. I don't know. But is is the mortuary behaviour also shifting from a collective treatment to something that's more individualistic, or, what, or do we have any idea about that? I don't know. I, I think what we have to go go on is the, the Zara ex, excavation, which of course was in Gigantia. So it may be that Gozo <coughs> was slightly more old fashioned. Right. In Tarjim, there might have been a distinction between the two islands uh, um, and between those two group, groupings. I mean, the, the, all the stuff at Tarjim is much later. It seems to me that the colonization, the initial colonization was Gozo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it spread gradually into Malta. Mm. But the top gene is, is the later period and then it reaches saturation and then we get to the point at which the whole thing dies dies out anyway and we're not quite sure why um sorry i've lost the question uh just if the if the mortuary practice shifted from collective to individual um because of course that is right. is a characteristic of some of the um neolithic barrows in in this country, isn't it? It's within Zara, within the Zara circle, it seems to have been collective throughout. But this isn't necessarily true of, of the Hal Safliini sure. um, sure. mortuary complex, but we don't really quite know about the Hal Safliini because the excavation records, which is 1902, has all been lost. Right, yeah. Oh, what sacrilege, what, what ridiculous. <laughs> um, and just one other thing we were talking with Marcel here um yeah on on the idea of the incest taboo I and mean, we would think in terms of those nine year intervals marking the nine years inside the sun the nine years outside the sun in terms of age sets quite significantly and of course you could work do you remember Chris about Wendy James I do. Yeah. So the age sets could indeed work in terms of marriage prohibitions to adjacent. Well, you could marry adjacent age sets. You could never marry within age sets or or double age sets. Yeah. And it, it, it would mean you'd have a, a sort of collective and synchronized initiation rituals. Um, which wouldn't be every year. They, they, you know, they'd be much more, much more widely separated in years and, and linked to these, um, um, the, the, nine, these nine year these nine year cycles. Yeah, well, yeah, would, yeah, would make it quite. That would 
um, fit patterns that are quite uh, characteristic for pastoralists, potentially, if there was a yeah. lot of... Yeah. Just one more little point, which is just that um, the, an, an obvious connection between the moon and the stars and a possible way of sort of reconciling different theories is just that um, you, you can only see the stars really properly when the moon isn't in the sky. And of course, to see the maximum number of stars and to see the Milky Way brightest, you want the darkest, darkest, darkest and longest night you'll ever get. And of course, as Lionel Williams pointed out, you know, if some, um, you know, some shaman asks the engineers, can they build me something so that we can have the longest, longest night and, and, and make sure that our ceremonies are happening then? I mean, that will be um, when, the, when the winter solstice uh, exactly coincides with the, with, the, with, the, with, the new, with the dark moon. So, I mean, and that would just give you, you know, you couldn't ask for more stars visible in the sky. And given that hunter gatherers, almost their motto, I and mean, we know that from the Hadza, but so many other groups, I mean, their, their motto is something like, let there be darkness, because without the darkness, you can't see the stars and you can't really, you can't really communicate with them, with them as some kind of ancestral spirits in some sense. Then you, you, you can see why darkness was so important and why, you know, why all these temples seem to be oriented in that direction. But anyway, I thought that was a, a really yeah. very, very, very brilliant um, presentation, John. Very, very interesting. And it's just interesting, isn't it? How, how actually, how, how closely your interpretations mirrors Lionel's interpretation of Stonehenge and Avery Stone Circle with the moon you know, running through its phases, sort of <laughs> reversing time. I mean, all those things, it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that what Lionel was, was finding is, isn't just confined to Wiltshire. It's so much, so much more widespread. Okay. Um, we're probably going to have to wind up unless we've got some other there, there is nice stuff in the chat but if there's any other um, points quickly um, that anybody would like to raise here um, that, uh, that was a, a really great exploration opening up all kinds of um, things there John it's, it's helped me get some idea of some sort of grip on this extraordinary culture and these extraordinary um, archaeology. It's absolutely mm. fascinating. Um, and skyscape archaeology is without any question key in interpretation. Um, so um, I'm just going to mention a couple of things for everybody here on um, next week's talk. It has relevance for tonight and it, it continues the theme, but it's taking us back to hunting cultures of the Upper Paleolithic with Bernie Taylor and his um, very extensive observations of rock art, um, cave rock art from the Upper Paleolithic as forms of lunar timekeeping, um, lunar timekeeping calendars in the Upper Paleolithic. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, and um, one other thing I was going to mention, because that is our last talk in this series, but we do have a very nice event on Saturday, June 24th. That's the first Saturday of the next new moon. Um, on the, in the Saturday afternoon with Chris Knight and, Law and Morna Finnegan on language and laughter. So some people may be interested in that. That's going to be our last um, event before the summer. Um, and please do, if you, if you want to come along, it's uh, five to seven o'clock on that Saturday, June 24th. Um, you can use the Zoom ID you use tonight. If you don't, you don't actually need to register, just come along. Um, but otherwise search for the event on Eventbrite. Uh, and otherwise, we've just got to say thanks to John. Thanks so much for that fantastic presentation. It was really appreciated, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Thank you, John. Yeah, yeah. well done, John. Well done. Great to have the record.